Hello, Grace Point family. We are back with you here for another midweek Bible study over the book of Romans. We're finishing up Romans chapter 6 tonight, and uh, we're excited to be here with you and glad to have you here on Facebook or YouTube, whichever way that you are uh, watching this. And, and we just pray that, that God is going to bless you through this time and, and uh, these uh, discussion points that we're going to talk about. Uh, it's always good to learn more about the Word of God. And so we're glad to have you here with us. I want to thank you all for joining us uh, for our Easter celebration. Uh, what we could, you know, how we could do it, whether it was in Bloomfield at the drive-in service or online watching Marcy. Um, it was just it was great to celebrate the risen King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And so uh, remind you today, he's still alive right now. Uh, he is going to be alive forever. Easter is not just a one-day-a-year celebration. It is something that we continue to remember all year long. So uh, I just pray that you are, are continuing on with your, uh, your daily walk with Jesus Christ because he is alive, he is inside of you, and uh, he wants to shine brightly wherever you go. So uh, we're going to talk today, again, Romans chapter 6. If you want to turn there now, we're going to spend just a couple minutes in prayer. And uh, then we'll get into the Bible study. So I'll turn it over to Marcy to, to lead us in, or to start us in prayer, and I'll finish us off. But uh, glad to have you with us here tonight. Marcy, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. And we are just so grateful that we get to come in and to learn more about you and to open up your word. And we're just so grateful that you reveal yourself to us through the scriptures. And Lord, we just pray that you... You be with our hearts and our minds tonight as we as we look at this scripture and and help us to learn what it is that we need to learn out of this and help us to change, you know, what it is that you want us to change, how so that we could we can be more in your image. And Lord, I just I just thank you for that. And I thank you that you allow us to have this relationship and that you you do give us those promptings of the things that we need to, to work on in our lives. And Lord, I pray for the prayer requests that we have uh, here in Sheraton. I pray for baby Miles. And Lord, I pray that you be with him and his family. And Lord, I pray for Dan and all the situation there. Do you be with him and and Tammy and and the doctors that are working there and for Charlotte uh, for the the surgery that she went through that she just continues to heal um, and Lord we just have give you this praise for Nathan as well um, and Lord I just pray in each one of these situations that you just continue to show yourself continue to show each one of these people that. Um, you just love them so much and continue to be with them. Lord, I pray for Bob as well. Um, Lord, I just pray in each situation where there's been a health concern, as you continue to be with the doctors, as you continue to be with um, those that are helping these people uh, to know what it is that they need to do to help these situations. Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you that we can come to you and, and to pray to you and and that we know that you're taking care of all of these situations, that you're right in each one of these things, and you're always right there. Heavenly Father, we just we do come before you, and, and we humbly uh, submit ourselves to you, Father God, and we pray that, that as you speak to our hearts, as you let us know uh, how you want us to, to move, um, how you want us to react and respond to the different things that we are facing, Father God, that we would be faithfully obedient to your Spirit. God, I pray that you would be um, with our frontline workers, continue to, to be with them and keep them safe through this time. I think of Scott Grimm and uh, Jalen Day, Father God. I think of um, uh, Ryan Miller. Um, I think of uh, just the different people that we've got working in these areas. Samantha, uh, Father God Davidson, who's, who's working uh, in, in a nursing home, Father God. I think of just all the different people that are, are, are working in these areas. Brendan Woodard, who's uh, a janitor in, 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 uh, in a hospital, Father God. And I know there's more than I'm forgetting, but would you just be with all of these frontline workers, Father God, and keep them safe in the areas that they are working. Father, I pray that you'd be with... Um, a couple of people that have been brought to our attention for that are connected to our church through through uh, different people, but for a, a young man named Michael Welch, uh, who I've known for years, but Father God, that you would help him uh, continue to heal uh, from the, the 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 health concern that he's going through right now. He's out in Wyoming, and I just pray that you would help him 
um, to be able to, to, to get healed as quickly as possible. Uh, his wife has not seen him for, for many days, uh, being hours away. Uh, and in this time where she can't even visit him at all, uh, Father God, I pray that you'd be in that circumstance. For Renita Mural, Father God, uh, that you would be with her in the circumstances that she is facing as well. Lord God, we just we love you. We praise your name. And we ask that you be with, with all the requests that have been mentioned and those that have not been mentioned, Father God, that you would just continue to have your hand on every person associated with our church. Uh, keep us safe, Father God, but keep us, keep us with a, a ministry focus in our heart and in our mind that we would have the urgency, the urgency to go out and, and share the gospel when and where we can. And right now that feels like there's not many opportunities for that. But Father God, that you can open up our hearts to, to see different ways for us to do that, to do exactly that, Father God. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Marcy, what do you got for us tonight? Okay, so tonight we are in Romans 6, and we're going to go through the, the, the rest of that chapter, so 15 through 23. And so right away I want us to kind of dive in and go ahead and read this, and then... Um, I've got a few, I've got a quote that kind of goes over um, what we discussed last time, a little of what we discussed last time, and then what we're going to discuss tonight. So, uh, Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 15, uh, it says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that through, or sorry, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I wanted to start out with this um, quote. It's in um, Great House's book, The uh, Wholeness in Christ. And in his quote, he's kind of, quoting another person as well, um, but I wanted to read that real quick. In verses 2 through 11, he has declared what it means to have died with Christ in faith and baptism. Now, what he's talking about, obviously, here is the it, what Paul's saying. Um, now, in verses 12 through 23, he sets forth the consequence of new life in Christ, urging, in effect, you have died and risen with Christ, now become the Christians you can become. You have died with Christ to sin, now become dead to sin. You are alive to God in Christ Jesus, now live to God alone and give free scope to his grace. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under the law, but under grace. And then he goes into this quote by Fitzmaier, um, Jo from Joseph Fitzmaier in his book covering Romans, and it says, "In thus obeying, says Fitzmaier, Christians verify in their lives the gift of divine grace and thus become what they have been enabled to become. That's, I mean, that the idea of becoming what you were enabled to become, or as he said it earlier, um, I love this, uh, you have died and risen with Christ, now become the Christians you can become. Mm -hmm. Like that's it's it's a choice still. You know we get back to that, um, and if the choice is possible. I even believe, and and I know this might get me some flack. I don't know, but the the, the choice is actually easy. Um, become the Christian you can become. 
Uh, there's things that might be difficult to leave behind. There might be things that are difficult to change. But the choice of saying, okay, I've got to be done with this part of my life that is that has just held me back for so long. I've got to become a follower of Jesus Christ. That choice is pretty simple, especially when your eyes are open to what it is to, to become a Christian now. Um, and so you, you make that choice, and then the, the repercussions of that might be difficult at times, but that's what our Christian community is for. That's what that's what our friends in Christ are for. That's what the Holy Spirit is for mm-hmm. inside of us. And so make the simple choice of becoming a Christian, becoming the Christian you can become because you've died to sin and are, are alive in Christ Jesus. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love how he says that, especially that fits my quote thus become what they or that Christians should become what they have been enabled to become right. like I just I loved the wording of that so um, and that comes from uh, the first part of his quote there because you obey mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and so uh, one of my favorite hymns um, of the church is, is trust and obey mm-hmm. um, that like we trust absolutely and then we obey mm-hmm. like so in obeying we can become the Christians Mm -hmm. we are enabled to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. So um, here in verse 15 where we started, Paul starts with another rhetorical question, kind of like what he did in verse 1. And so the commentary commentary said that in verse 1, that what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Um, He's more saying, he was asking the question, are we to continue to allow sin to rule our lives, which is dealing with an unbroken slavery to sin. Now, in verse 15, this rhetorical question, he's asking, shall we excuse any known sin because we're not under the law but under grace? And it's dealing with an individual act of disobedience. Um, And then this, uh, I got another great house quote um, out of commentary, His rhetorical question implicitly states the ideal. The notion of sinning Christians is an oxymoron. I really like that. Uh, (laughs) um, Now, being being a Nazarene pastor, uh, myself and you being one in training, I'm I'm still in training myself, but the the idea of a sinning Christian, uh, (laughs) I'll get myself in trouble if I go too far with this, but it is that I love that he calls it out there as an mm-hmm. oxymoron. That mm-hmm. You cannot be a sinning Christian. Uh, you can be a Christian who struggles with sin, but but what's your reaction and your response to that mm-hmm. sin? Uh, are you running to God in response to that sin that might still have a root in your life, mm-hmm. or are you continuing to to let that thing fester and, and manifest itself in different ways in your life? Um, that's, that's just not, that's not Christianity. That's not following Christ. Uh, and so to have sin in the life of a Christian is to not be a Christian at all. Right. 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 And that's, and again, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about when you recognize that there is sin in your life or a sin that God's calling out, what do you do with that? Mm-hmm. Do you run to him, confess and repent and move forward? Or do you hold on to that and, you know, have that same idea of, you know, I just, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I've always done. Uh, or are you ready to be a brand new creation in Christ? Right. Yeah. It's that, that, that I think of, you know, the Wesley definition of sin, of sin. I get that willful disobedience. So if you have, it, God has brought this to your attention, are you going to go, sorry, that's just the way I am and right. just defy that he has brought this to your attention? Or are you going to go, wow, I didn't even realize that, and I'm sorry, and, you know, that that it's that willful disobedience. It's not that we're going to be perfect in everything that we do, right. but it's how we react to that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, um, in ver- so in verse 16, uh, where am I? Uh, don't you know that when y- you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey whether you are slaves to sin which leads to death or to obedience which leads to righteousness um now paul is saying here and this kind of leads in our 
previous conversation kind of leads into this. Paul is saying that we will be slaves to sin or slaves to God, making the argument that not all sin is just missing the mark, but some sin is very much a willful disobedience of God. That's good. I mean, so if you look at, uh, and I, I don't know if I'll be able to turn there quickly, but because I want to get exactly right, First John 1, 9, um, and, and I'm gonna, I'll get there. Uh, so First John 1, 9, it, it's a very popular verse. Um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So there's two different things. There's sins and unrighteousness. And that unrighteousness is the missing the mark part, right? Mm -hmm. So like, and, that, and those are the things that God brings to our attention. Like, hey, you've been doing this wrong or you've been thinking about this wrong. We need to change, tweak that a little bit. Sin is outright defiance against the will of God. Just like you said, it's a known violation or it's a willful violation of a known law of God. And so when we do that, that is absolutely individual, personal sin that we participated in willingly, knowingly, we participated in that. And so there's a distinction between the two. So some sin is, is you know, I just, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's something that maybe we were raised to believe a certain thing. And then over the course of time, God has made you aware that, hey, that's not right. Mm -hmm. We need to change that. And, and you change when, as you get made known of that, and that's, that's great. But it wasn't a personal or it wasn't a, a, a willful act against the known law of God. It was something you always believed was good, and, and it turns out it wasn't, and so we changed it. And then this, this sin, though, as you put it there, the, um, it's very much a willful disobedience of God. It's not simply just missing the mark mm -hmm. of perfection. It's, it's knowing that this is the standard, and you chose mm -hmm. to, admit to, to, go, to go away from that standard. Um, that's, that's absolutely, you're either, you're, you could be a slave to that for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, moving on uh, there, like verse 17, but thanks be to God that uh, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. And so it says there that Paul is thankful that slavery to sin defines their past, not their present situation. And Great House in, in the commentary said, basically Paul is saying, uh, you hold, wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you have been entrusted. Now, and back when we had our, I don't remember how many weeks into this we were, but we already talked about that, that, that the teaching which we've been entrusted, and he was talking about, you know, the Jews. And so that's kind of, Paul's kind of bringing that back. Um, you wholeheartedly obey the form of teaching in which you have been entrusted. Um, so from the heart, this obedience that's deeply felt. Yeah. I think that, you know, you reading that verse, thanks be to God that you, uh, that, that you used to be slaves to sin, but now, um, I'm going to get it right again, uh, you used to be slaves that you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. So, again, there's a change. There's that, as we talked about, I think it was last week or the week before, crisis moment. There's this, this moment that comes up where you change. You choose. The moment happens and you choose. And so, thanks be to God that even though I used to be like this, after this moment, now I follow the teachings that, that have claimed my allegiance, mm -hmm. right? And that's really cool phrasing. I, like, I really like that. Claim, the, the teaching that has claimed my allegiance. I still, one of my, uh, the favorite testimonies I've heard from somebody is, is from my father-in-law who um, he, was, he was searching out. He, he knew that he wanted to, to become a Christian, uh, to, to, you know, this Jesus thing. He was trying to figure it out. And he, he stumbled upon the Nazarene church and uh, he said, this was the thing that lined up with what I believe to be true. And again, it doesn't, it's not, I'm not talking about necessarily Nazarene or, or anything like that, other than to say that he sought something that he could give his allegiance to mm -hmm. and could follow it deeply within his heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a very cool thing. So whatever church you might go to or, or want to go to or think about going to, make sure that you can follow um, their teaching with the fullness of your heart and become 
uh, be um, uh, just full, full, wholehearted. I think is the word you use there. Wholehearted following of that. So that that, that teaching claims your allegiance. Mm-hmm. I think that's really good. Mm-hmm. So um, there in verse eighteen, you've been set free from sin and become ha- have become slaves to righteousness. And so the, the, we're talking in the commentary um, there that both Jewish and Roman Christians knew that baptism, so kind of going back, I don't it was last week or the week before that, knew that baptism was the symbol they had been set free from their former involuntary slave to sin. So that baptism was the symbol that they had been set free from their former involuntary slave to sin and become obedient slaves to righteousness. So they were, they knew, it said that they knew that that was the moment where they had cut their ties. That was the symbol of the moment that they had cut their ties to being slaves to sin and being obedient slaves to righteousness. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. If there, there, are, there are people that I have baptized um, that I wish I could could go back and say, are, are you sure you want to do this? Because it really is, like you said, though, it's that symbol of, okay, I have made this choice. Mm-hmm. And yet there are people that I have baptized over the years that it's very clear they didn't actually make the choice. Mm-hmm. They just wanted to, whether, whether in their mind being baptized would um, save them and I, and I can promise I didn't teach that, but I think it's ingrained in our our society a little bit that uh, when we when we are baptized, that's something that saves us. Um, the, so so that that could be a possibility, or they just they know that they should, or they know that they they want you know this I, I I want you know whatever it is that you might want, but are you willing to actually do what it takes to get what you want, mm-hmm. right? Are you willing to follow Jesus so that you can have eternal life? Or do you want to try this this shortcut method, right? And and baptism is not a shortcut method in that. It's 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 the symbol of a choice mm-hmm. that you made. And if you don't follow through on that choice, shame on you. Right? That's a that's a big deal. Uh and so that's I think that's a big distinction between maybe the, the Christians of that time and, and some of the Christians of today that use baptism as some sort of my mom wanted me to do it, you know, kind of a thing, yeah. or, or I know that I should do it, so I'm going to do it, but I'm not yet, I haven't, I haven't yet made that decision to change. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Right. So going on to verse 19, um, I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations, just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. And I've always read that passage and kind of Paul to me has always been kind of, I'm using this just so that you can understand that. He's kind of a jerk. (laughs) He's kind of a jerk, yeah. (laughs) But it said in the commentary, and maybe, you know, it's obviously all interpretation, but it said Paul is is saying that it's difficult to explain divine truth in language accommodating to human weakness. And that sounds so much (laughs) better. Other than saying you're you're just not very smart, or you're not smart (laughs) enough to understand what we're talking about. Yeah, no, I like that. So, um, kind of as it stated before, or as we've stated before, so they said, um, they've now said, you know, Paul's now said, as slaves to impurity and over in ever increasing wickedness. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness and leading to holiness. And so we're kind of going back to that, like what we talked about, and I think it was last week, you're either a weapon or a slave to sin or a weapon, or a slave to righteousness. There's no neutral option, but we get to choose our master. Mm -hmm. So that's Paul's kind of taking that argument um, there, that that weapon, um, that weapon that we talked about, uh, and and two, again, like that's just, he's coming back to that argument. Weapons or slaves to sin, or weapons or slaves to righteousness. There's no neutral option. and then that, for that holiness, um, we're talking about that sanctification. 
Um, and that's what he's talking about there. So, that, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. So sanctification. And then, so in the commentary, there's this quote um, from a man named, or his last name's Keck. Uh, but he, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he said sanctification used in the Greek either meant the process or the result. There were two different words that were translated the same as the holiness. So results was used in like 2 Corinthians 7, 1 and 1 Thessalonians 3, 13. But here in Romans, this word is meaning the process. So like the process of sanctification, not the end result of the process. So... And I thought that was a good thing to, to kind of point out that sometimes this holiness and, you know, it, that we, we tend to say holiness, sanctification. But sometimes it's talking about the end result and sometimes it's more talking about the process of. Um, I, think, I think that's good to, to understand for sure that we are, in a, we are in a process towards full or entire sanctification um, and, and it's part of the process. We're, we're growing in our faith. We're growing in maturity. We're growing in understanding and knowledge. Um, and so becoming a slave to righteousness is the is part of that process. Like, And it could be the start of the process, but we, it's part of that process of becoming um, sanctified, uh, becoming, becoming a full, wholehearted follower of Jesus Christ. That doesn't leave anything behind. And I think in that verse 19, it's good to, to note here, um, just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. Now, you might say out there, I, I'm not being wicked, right? I'm not, I'm, I'm not being impure. I'm, pretty, I'm a good person, right? Um, and the reality is, though, exactly as you point out here from this quote from Keck, and we talked about, a bunch last week, there's either one or the other. Mm -hmm. There's no middle ground, right? And so what you might think is is okay, if it's not leading you towards holiness, if it's not leading you towards uh, becoming a slave to righteousness, which is, which is a following after God, then it is evil. It is wicked. It is impure. Um, and so we've got to understand that the things of this earth that might not seem so bad on the face of things, if it's not leading you towards the relationship with God or growing you in your relationship with God, it is those things. It is wicked. It is evil. It is impure. Uh, and that's, that's the harsh reality that a lot of people don't like to hear or talk about, because it's just, it's, but it's the truth. It's either one or the other. And now there's grace in, in moving towards righteousness. There's grace in moving towards holiness. But if you aren't willing to acknowledge the things that aren't moving you towards holiness are, in fact, wicked or impure, you're going to get stuck in those impurities. You're going to get stuck in that wickedness, and you're never going to become free to move to righteousness mm -hmm. and holiness. Mm -hmm. So there, to the commentary, and it's just another way of putting what we've already stated. Um, Paul is using a human analogy as slave and master, but really the question is whether or not we will put ourselves fully and unconditionally at God's disposal. Will we volunteer to be used as he sees fit in the cause of right? Mm. Yeah. That's good. Uh, that that w it, it is a volunteer. It goes back to that that idea of choice. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Yeah. And then, so in that that idea or that idea of volunteer, um, as RJ said it before, I've got this big quote, but I couldn't break it up. There there was no no part of it that I wanted to to try to reword or to to leave out. I just it had to be all of it, and it's out of this commentary by Great House. Um, but he said, apparently only volunteers will do. In justification, God sets us free from our involuntary slavery to sin. But he leaves it to justified believers to decide, or to decide how we are going to use our freedom. To serve 
anyone or anything other than God is to rejoin the rebellion against him. It is to be a victimized by the illusory dream of autonomy. autonomy. I, I even looked that word up because I keep freezing on it. It is to become hopelessly addicted to the lifestyle opposed to all that is just, right, and holy. It is to waste our lives in pursuit of a hollow dream that is doomed to defeat and death. Christians are not justified merely to be proudly displayed as trophies on the wall of God's heavenly den. God has an earthly mission for the former sinners he has salvaged from their headlong plummet to certain death. He has things he wants done in this world, and he wants the church to do it. Paul's imperatives imply that God will not coerce us to serve him. We must choose to cooperate in his cause. Justified believers are not merely airlifted out of a war zone and placed into a holding pattern, awaiting permission to land in the celestial city. There's a war to be fought to recover the sovereignty of this rebellious planet to its one rightful master. And we are enlisted to serve as God's weapons against the insurgency. If we make ourselves fully and exclusively available to God, he will not only set us apart for his purposes, but also set us within a holy community that will equip us with the holy character we need to accomplish these purposes. Under these circumstances, neutrality is impossible. Hmm. There are just some really good um, words and some really good, you know, th the way he describes those things. Christians are not ju justified merely to be proudly displayed as trophies on the wall of God's heavenly den. And then for him to say, believers are not merely airlifted out of a war zone and placed into a holding pattern awaiting permission to land in the celestial city. I think sometimes we think that's really what we're here for. It's just, you know, oh, we've been justified, so now God gets to put us on <laughs> his mantle, <laughs> or, you know, like, we're just, we're, we're justified now, we're saved, so now it's heaven. Like, no, we have things we need to do here on earth, and we need to make that choice mm -hmm. that we are going to be on God's side, yeah. and we are going to fight for his cause. You know, this the sovereignty, fought to recover the sovereignty of this rebellious planet to its one rightful master. <gasps> Amen. Like, that's... That there's a lot of good just kind of word pictures in there that yeah. help us to understand that that it's not a, the, the the prayer of salvation is not the end all right it's not it's not where our journey ends but it's actually where it begins um, and so when we when we get to that point and we 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 find that real relationship with Jesus Christ that's when life with God actually starts and we get to participate with him in his mission on earth mm -hmm. and there is no neutrality you can't be you can't be riding that fence you've got to choose as a volunteer to follow after god's will mm -hmm. and do the work that he's called us to do mm -hmm. and but as i said before uh, put ourselves fully and unconditionally at god's disposal Amen. um to volunteer to be used as he sees fit for the cause of right yeah. not as we want to be used <laughs> As he yes. sees fit for yep. us to be used. As he sees and fit. And to be okay yeah. with that. Yeah. Like, that's really, I mean, that's a hard decision. Like, to become a Christian and to say, I'm okay with however you want to use me. Mm -hmm. Like, that's that's a big deal. It is. And, you know, I think that's kind of one of the points that a lot of Christians miss. They kind of sign up and, like, yeah, because this is going to be great. And, look, I'm going to make it to heaven. But... Like, to be okay with whatever it is. Yeah. And I think there are, there are people who sign up for the, the the role of Christian, and they want to be, they have an idea in their mind of what that's going to look like um, for themselves. Where they, oh, I'm, I'm going to be a pastor. I'm going to be 
a worship leader. I'm going to be uh, on the front lines of this thing and, and doing what I want to do here. And God might have something totally different in mind for you. And we only find that out through obediently following the will of God that we that we sense through the Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we read his word. Uh, not everyone's called to be a pastor. Not everyone's called to be a singer. Not everyone's called to be whatever. We are called to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and God will reveal to us what that is for each one of us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His will, not ours. Yeah, yeah. Well, just I had told Adam the other day, I said sometimes when you know God gives you these assignments and you, you know it, I go, the, the more the more I feel like I'm, you know, going into alignment with what it is that he wants of my life, <laughs> the more I kind of go, ah, well, now I kind of understand some of these Old Testament stories where these <laughs> characters are like, eh, no, I think a belly of a whale was like more enticing at this yeah. point. Because yep. sometimes God asks us to do these really hard things. That, that's what he wants us to do. Mm-hmm. These things that take us out of our comfort zones. Yeah. And, and make us fully rely on him. Right, right. right. Yeah. And so sometimes it's just like, you know, we've got to, and we've got to say, okay, you know, I'm completely and unconditionally at your disposal, however you want to use right. me. Um, and we've got to be okay with that. However, he is that he's asking us to be used, whether it takes us out of our comfort zone or not. <laughs> so um, here in verse tw- or twenty, um, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. So it said there in the commentary that free, like modern day, that free would be in quotations because. Um, it's really the emphasis, the emphasis, it would emphasize it because it's not really freedom. So you're free from the control of righteousness. Um, and then verse 21, what benefits did you reap at the time from the things you were, or from the th- from the things you are now ashamed of, the things that result in death. So it said there that benefits, um, so that benefits, which is also you know sometimes translated fruits. Mm-hmm. So that fruits, <laughs> what what fruits or what benefits um, were the things you got out of that? But the things that are, you're now ashamed of, and the things that result in death. So it's kind of that Paul throwing in that you're free, you know, free from righteousness, and what fruits or what benefits did you get from that? Um, that emphasis on those two words, because they weren't really fruits, and they weren't. It wasn't really a free freedom from righteousness. It was, but it wasn't like wasn't something freedom. good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've heard it, I've heard it preached before that um, uh, that that when you you know some people have a problem with Christianity because it takes away your freedom to do what you want to do. The reality is, if you do something that you want to do that that goes against the will of God. Not only are you hurting yourself and hurting your actual freedom to live the way that you want to do, usually what you're doing is also hurting the freedom of other people to live the way that they want to do. So if I, if I think about um, uh, a husband who walks out on his family, right, because he can do that. He's, he has the freedom. He's free uh, from the control of righteousness to do whatever he wants. He walks out on his family. Now, he's also hurt. The, the reality, though, is, is the freedom for his life is to live a life that is pleasing to him and to God. And if, you, if, you, if you're leaving a wife and a kid behind or kids behind, you've hurt your own freedom to live the life that you're supposed to live. And you're hurting their freedom to live the life that they deserve to live. Um, and so it's, it really is it, it, the freedom in quotes is really true. It's a sarcastic idea to be to be free from the control of righteousness no it's being under the control of righteousness that actually sets us free mm-hmm. and then as you said it goes on in verse 21 the the benefits or the fruit that we gain benefits that we gain you know from living a life of sin things that we are now ashamed of and wish we had never done there are no fruits of that there is no benefit to that um, we've only hurt ourselves and hurt other people. And so freedom freedom in righteousness is really the only freedom that there is. We hurt ourselves and others 
when we think that freedom means we can do whatever we want. Right. Yeah. Right. So there um, in verse 22, uh, but now you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Um, so there to be a slave of God is to become a weapon of righteousness. So kind of like what bringing that thought clear, full circle. Um, and the benefit of this leads to holiness or sanctification. The end results of sanctification is eternal life. Um, and so the, it's just that, that to be a slave to God is to become a weapon of righteousness. And like, like you said, you know, that freedom... Um, in, in that, you know, as Paul is saying, you know, he has to put it in human terms for us, but that slave to God, to be, to be unconditionally at God's disposal, there's such freedom in that. Because God really is this good, good father. And he's going to, you know, sometimes, yes, like I stated, uh, ask us to do things that kind of take us out of our comfort zone. But man, the way we grow and the way we learn in those things, and it is really is this freedom as opposed to, you know, the the free of righteousness and fruits and benefits. Like, there really is that freedom to, you know, being used as a weapon of righteousness. I think that's very true. And then the, the idea that following that freedom that we find in Christ leads us to holiness, sanctification, which leads to eternal life, mm-hmm. right? I think that's, so like even from a human human standpoint, we understand that we want the best for ourselves. The best for ourselves, the best for me, the best for you is eternal life with God. The way to get that is to live a life of righteousness, holiness, sanctification Mm -hmm. that's that's the way that that's the path to um eternal life with god Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there in 23 uh it says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life in christ jesus our lord so that wages um there once again it would be a modern day quote like the wages um but like Paul is saying it is more of a punishment, so wages. Um, wages in that time, actually, the word used there was a ration of money paid to soldiers for their service. So still going on that that kind of this is a war and you can be on this and use as a weapon of righteousness or a weapon of, um, of sin. Um, so this wages it was a ration of money paid to soldiers for the service, and it was paid in increments as well as at the end of the task. And so there's this this wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our our Lord. So Paul is very quick to point out there that this is a gift and not works based for your work. Um, only by God's grace do we get this. Amen. There's not I mean there's not much to add to that. That's just sin. There's a there's a there's a payment there's a there's a payment for sin, and that's death, right? Mm-hmm. And then the payment for being a slave to God rather than a slave to sin is actually a gift. It's something that God still gives out. God gives out the punishment of death, but He also gives out the gift of of grace, which leads to our ability to choose holiness, to choose sanctification, to to inherit an her- eternal life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, that's kind of closing out that chapter. And this final thought, I wanted to um, ask this question for us to kind of think about um, from this N.T. Wright uh, Bible study book. Um, it says, slavery to sin or to God in his covenant purposes, embracing our true identity as freedom, freed from sin, and presenting ourselves fully to covenant justice are all main ideas in chapter 6. Imagine if Paul were to look up for a moment from writing this letter and glance around the church, maybe your church, at the start of the 21st century. 
what might he say regarding these themes? Like, are we actually, you know, are, are we as a church, as are we as individual people of the church, being unconditionally at God's disposal? Are we actually being used as weapons of righteousness? Are we just doing things that are making us feel comfortable just because we want, you know, we're in it for our own comfort, <laughs> not for or for being at unconditionally at God's disposal? I think even even for me as a pastor, um, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with being a pastor. Um, I, you know, whether whether you know, I believe God's gifted me to to do certain things, and 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 yet I find myself just just finding it easy to do some of the things that a pastor is is called to do. I can preach a sermon pretty easily. I can I can talk about the Bible pretty easily. So those are actually in my comfort zone. It might not be in your comfort zone to do those things, and so. Uh, stepping out of your comfort zone could could include some of those things, teaching and and just talking about the Bible. Uh, for me, it's it's got to find different ways to to step out of my comfort zone, and 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 sometimes that's dealing with people in one on one situations. Sometimes that's um, dealing with certain people groups that I might not find myself uh, associating with more more often than not. Uh, and so I think it's really important that that each one of us finds the thing that takes us out of our comfort zone. That God is calling us to to do and participate in, and so that's that's what I get out of that. And I think that's that's spot on. Paul wants us uh, as as people of the church to take God wherever we go, and we're not going to do. I mean, and and we're if we're only going to, uh, you know, do the God thing when it's comfortable for us, it's not going to be very effective. We're not going to we're not going to impact the world for Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I I would say for a lot of my Christian life, I didn't really do a whole lot that made me uncomfortable because I, w- I like, even if I felt like God was calling me to it, um, because I just didn't want to do that. Uh, to me, you know, <laughs> to, to be completely transparent, uh, you know, teaching, teaching Bible studies for me is a way out of my comfort zone kind of thing. I mean, I've become a little more comfortable with it, but, um, you know, the idea of teaching a Bible study was kind of very, um, very scary to me at the beginning (laughs) and still is sometimes. Um, but yeah, it was this like, okay, if this is what you're asking me to do, then, I'll do it, and let's, you know, you've got to teach me how to do that, and you've got to equip me to do that, and, you know, what I need to learn out of this, you need to point out to me, because I, you know, I want to, I want to be who you, you need, and, you know, who you need me to be, um, to be most effective, yeah, and I just think, you know, how many times, like, I, I, a lot of my Christian life, I, I did that, like, lived in my comfort zone, just because it was more comfortable there. <laughs> and yeah, how I many of us uh, in church do that? Yeah, and I think one of the big things is sometimes we think that if it's not comfortable, it's not right. Mm-hmm. Right? We, we get this, this impression that uh, if it's not comfortable, then God must not be in it. If God's going to be leading me to this thing, it's going to just work out magically. Mm-hmm. Every little thing is going to fall in place, and that is just not the case. Right, we have to persevere. We have to push through those times when it's not working out, and that's part of stepping out of your comfort zone. Is to recognize that I've got to fight for this thing I believe in. I got to fight for this thing. I'm a, le- I'm a, I am, I am fully a- allied or a- allied with the the Word of God and what it teaches me, and that's going to mean there's going to be a fight at times mm-hmm. to make sure that I get my message out, the message of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and we've got to be fully, you know, to know what it is that God's asking us to do. We have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. We have to be in our word. We have to be studying. We have to be praying. We have to, you know, be fully open to that prompting um, of the Holy Spirit and know even when the times when it's not working out the way that we would have expected it to or where we get a little bit of that pushback, we've got to sit secure in that 
this is what God has asked me to do. And I need to persevere through this because through this perseverance, you know, it comes growth. And you know, didn't we go through that verse <laughs> earlier, just a couple weeks ago? Yeah. Um, through that, that perseverance, we get that growth. And, you know, the more we grow, then, you know, I, I feel like the more we grow, then kind of a little easier it's going to get to step out of our comfort zone and to, to step into that and go, you know what, God has called me to do this, and I trust him. I trust him, and I will obey um, through this. So, yep. Well, why don't you close in prayer, Marcy? Okay. Lord, we just we just thank you for this day, and we just thank you for um, for allowing us to come and to read your word and to learn more about us about you and lord i just i just pray that um you just continue to work on us and the the things of our life that maybe we haven't given complete control of to you that you will just and you'll just point that out to us lord and i just pray that there's so many churches or so many people in our churches that will just make their choice to be a weapon of righteousness, to be totally at your disposal, whatever it is that you're asking them to do. Lord, I just pray that you just continue to shape us and to mold us how it is that you want us to be. Lord, I just thank you for that. I just thank you that you do that. Lord, I just pray that you just continue to, to be with us this week, continue to bring to mind um, what it is that you need us to do, even in this situation, uh, to be, you know, to be serving you and to be showing your love to others. And Lord, I just, I just thank you for that. And I thank you that you gave us the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can prompt us in those things. Lord, I just, I just thank you. We just thank you and we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.